Good morning. Good news about the campers uh, at Twin Lakes this week. That's great news. Um, camp is a place that gets a hold of your heart. How many of you went to camp at some time in your life as a kid and it made a big difference? <clears throat> wow, a lot of you. More so than in the first. I think there were a lot in the first service who's just been longer and they just couldn't remember to raise their hands. But you, you remember... I remember, uh, I remember more taking students to camp than, I'm not sure if I actually ever went, I don't remember, but I remember taking students to camp, and oh, the stories that we can tell, right, as, uh, as youth pastors and former youth pastors. So uh, Trenton, as he said, was in Pella at the Fellowship for Christian Athletes camp this past week, and they had a great, had a great time on the campus there in Pella. So a lot going on, and you have, you have helped as a church at times knowingly, at times unknowingly, you have helped to send kids to camp, and thank you for that, because these are investments that we make in these kids' lives, and as they go and they get challenged and they get changed, that is, Lord willing, an investment that's going to be returning for a long time. Hey, other good news this week. You know, some weeks, doesn't it seem like anything you turn on, the TV, it's just like, I mean, I don't know who turns the TV on anymore, but you know what I mean. You watch the news and it just seems like everything's bad. But this week we had the revelation of these pictures from the James Webb telescope. Throw the first one up on the screen. This, this picture is half of a picture. Just, just leave it there for just a little bit. Um, this is half of a picture from the James Webb uh, telescope, which is out in space a million miles from the earth, which is four times the distance of the sun from the earth. The Hubble is in very near earth orbit. It's not very far. But this James Webb is way out there. It got launched in January, and it the end of January, it got to its location, and it's been setting itself up, and just recently it began to not really take pictures, because it doesn't take pictures like cameras take pictures. They're more scientific observations that get, then get translated into images that our eyes can see. This is a half of one picture, and it is said that if you took a grain of sand and you held it a half arm's length up to the night sky, that that would be one of these pictures how much of the sky that you're seeing. That is so, that is crazy. So this is half a grain of sand. And as, as you look at it on the right, you've got the, almost the uh, Christmas ornament type. Those are the near stars. And they're just the reflecting off of the lens because they're bright and they're closer. But the, the faded ones that are off in the background, some of them are actual galaxies and they're saying that the speed of light is, you know, so many miles per second. And that th these images are like billions of years old. Now, I don't know about all this stuff, obviously. That's not my, my field. But it is, it is amazing. They're saying we're actually looking back in time as we look at these images because the light started traveling a long, long time ago. I was told by somebody leaving the first service, they said, I heard one of the astronomers say this week, here's the quote, we now know that there was a beginning. Wait a minute. In the beginning. But that's cool, isn't it? That one of them would say, we now know that there was a beginning. I don't know why. I don't know what these pictures show or what this observation shows. Show, show that second one. Yeah, then this is the other half of the grain of sand. My mom forbade me at age seven to watch Star Trek any longer, the original series, because she said, and I quote, your head is always in the stars. That was 52 years ago. I could, I could stand here and look at this all morning. <laughs> I really could. This stuff is just fascinating to me. But now... Knowing what I know from Scripture, it's even more fascinating. Okay, we can say goodbye to the pictures for now. And 
the reason I put those up there, I mean, as a, as a pastor, you can use those pictures for any illustration. Trust me. I mean, it's, it's just that good. You can't not talk about them. Why? Because of what we're going to read at the end of the service, and you'll see that. But as I look at that and you think, okay, talk about a keyhole satellite picture. Talk about looking through the keyhole and not being able to see much. A grain of sand's worth of the sky would reveal that much. What in the world is out there? What is out there? That's so crazy. And the God who created all that is spoke to us in one language. Just one. Well, okay. Kind of three. Aramaic, Hebrew, and Greek. But in John 14, Jesus probably spoke these words in Aramaic. They were written and recorded for us in Greek and then translated into English. That's a pretty narrow funnel when you start with a God who creates all that is. I mean, that grain of sand, you're not even talking like 360. 360 would just be on a line how many grains of sand that would be, but you're talking, and I don't know the terminology, but the whole circumspect, the whole thing, the God who created all that is narrows his voice into a language that then has to be translated into all the languages of the world. And there are translators doing this right now. And they've got it charted out so that they can finish the Word of God in every known language on the planet. And we're talking as the Alliance about Great Commission completion. How can we get the gospel, the good news of Jesus, to everybody on the planet? But just this whole idea that this infinite God put himself down finitely in this book, but that it's enough. He says it's enough. In fact, he says, nobody better add anything to this. But it's also written at the very last verse of the book of John that, oh my goodness, if everything were to be written that Jesus said and did, the the world couldn't contain the books that would be written. But we have this one. And this morning we have the last half of John 14. But it's a peek into that upper room last words teaching of Jesus before he would ascend, before he would, well, before he would go to the cross. Then he had 40 days post-resurrection. Then he ascended. But these these are the last words before it seemed as though evil would win. And I want you to look at them with me because we're in the, um, I talked to you about the bullseye being John 15. And we started out here in John 13 with Jesus and foot washing and showing us what to do with authority. And then we went over to John 17 and we saw that Jesus wanted love and unity in his people. And then we came in and we looked at those two passages about the disciples and their anxiety and their worry and Jesus speaking to them. And now we're coming in to these two sets that are just outside of the bullseye. And they both talk about the Holy Spirit. On either side of the I am the vine and you are the branches, John teaches, quotes Jesus when he talked about the Holy Spirit. And today we're talking about that, that intersection of faith and um, love. Yeah. I just taught it an hour ago. The intersection of faith and love. The intersection of our culture and love is what? Attractiveness, um, exploitation of people, uh, transactional relationships, desire for physical gratification. And if you stop pleasing me, and if for some reason you're not in relationship with me the way I want you to be, then I need to find somebody else. That's our culture and 
what they call love. But the intersection of our faith and love, we see something that we wouldn't normally think about, but we see obedience. We see Jesus talking about obedience here in John chapter 14. So let's just read it. Let's read John 14, the first, uh, well, the last verses, verses 15 through 31. He says, Jesus says to them, if you love me, keep my commands. Can I just pause there for a second? I don't know how you respond to that. If you love me, keep my commands. It seems like it's transactional, right? If you do this, I'll do that. But it's not at all. It's responsive. It's how we respond to the one who loves us and what love looks like. What love looks like. Because God says, God puts himself out there and Jesus puts himself out there and he says, I'm going to do this with you. I'm going to be this way toward you. And if you receive it, then this is how you'll be back to me. And it's, it's actually a response. And if you won't be that way back to me, basically Jesus says, it's because you haven't received me. You haven't loved me. Because when you receive what I give you, that's going to be the natural response is going to be obedience. So, okay, let me keep going. If you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world can't accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. And on that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. Then Judas, not Judas Iscariot, another one said, But Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus replied, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. All this I have spoken while still with you, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Wow, that phrase right there, that'd be worth thinking about for a while. The world gives, but he said, that's not how I give. I don't give to you like the world gives to you. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. You heard me say, I'm going away and I'm coming back to you. If you love me, You'd be glad that I'm going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. I have told you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe. I will not say much more to you, for the Prince of this world is coming. He has no hold over me, but he comes so that the world may learn that I love the Father and do exactly what my Father has commanded me. Come now, let us leave. Wow, there's so much in this short passage. Let's look at that very last phrase just to start. He says, I've got more to say to you, but the prince of this world is coming. I'm about to get betrayed and handed over And my life is going to be taken from me. This is going to happen. He goes, but the prince of this world is coming. And then the word again, I I keep throwing this out to you almost weekly now. Henna, for the purpose of, this is why. But he comes, 
henna, so that, why is he coming? So that the world may learn what? That I love the Father. Wow. The powers of Satan, all of the junk of the devil is going to be thrown at Jesus. And what's the world going to learn about Jesus? That he loves the Father. Again, what's the teaching here? We're going to have trouble in the world, right? We're going to have chaos come our way. We're going to have problems in the world. But the world can also learn how we respond and how we react shows that we love God, shows our love for God. Because Jesus would kneel and say, in the garden, I really don't want to drink this cup, but if it's your will, I'll do it. But if it can be taken from me, take it. But it wasn't God's will to take it. And he decided he would drink. And he says that this evil one comes, the prince of this world, so that the world would learn two things. Number one, that I love the Father. And number two, that I do exactly what my Father has commanded me. Jesus doing exactly what God has commanded him. So apparently, God is, the Father has put the Son in this situation and has commanded him. How does the one person of the Godhead command the other person of the Godhead? How does that work? But Jesus had just finished saying, the Father is greater than me. The Father is greater than me. So many times Jesus puts himself in a position where he's saying, I'm telling you to do something, I do it first. I'm telling you to obey, look at me, I'm obeying. I'm gonna, I do exactly what the Father tells me to do. And I love the Father, and the world is going to see that I love the Father. And I'm asking you to love the Father. And I'm asking you to love one another the way I have loved you. So Jesus, over and over, he puts himself in a position to be our exemplar, to be the example, the model. And we, can just, we just look to Jesus, right, where Scripture says he's the author and he's the perfecter, the finisher, the completer of our faith. And Satan meant it for evil, but God uses it for good. The prince of this world is coming so that the world may learn that I love the Father and I'm going to do exactly what the Father tells me to do. So interesting. Now, here's something else that's interesting. The end of verse 24. He says, they belong, these words you hear are not my own, they belong to the Father. Now look what it says. Who sent me? Who sent Jesus? The Father. The Father sends the Son. Jesus told stories. The story about he sent the servants to collect the money from the vineyard, his vineyard. The owner of the vineyard sent the servants. But the people running the vineyard didn't want to give the money over. So what they do? They beat up the servants. They, they overran the servants who came. They rebuffed the owner. They didn't send the money. And then what Jesus teaches that the owner says, I'll send my son. I'll send my son. Surely they won't do anything to my son, but they kill the son. The father sends the son. And Jesus told a number of stories, a number of parables, where you've got the father and the son in the story. You remember the prodigal who comes back, and the father is waiting. Jesus wasn't the son in that story, but the father was the father, waiting, running to receive the prodigal back. All these stories and all these pictures, all the Old Testament stories, they're, they're all forms and figures of the real relationship that God has with his people and the real situation that God has with us 
And over and over we see ourselves in a lot of these stories. So the father sent the son, and then the very uh, two verses later in verse 26, he says, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the father will send, God also sends the spirit. The Father sends the Son, and he sends the Spirit. But he, when he sends the Spirit, it says, whom the Father will send in my name. What does that mean? Well, Jesus had been given authority over everything on the earth. We saw that in John chapter 13, right before he washes the disciples' feet. Jesus is the Lord. He's got all authority. And in the name of Jesus, the Father then is going to send the Spirit after Jesus ascends to heaven. They're waiting in the upper room. They're scared. They're in Jerusalem. They think they're next. They think they're the next ones that are going to go to the cross. And then they're praying. And in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit shows up. He sends the Spirit. They look like tongues of fire on their head. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, their lives were changed. All of a sudden, these guys who couldn't put together a lunch for people, all of a sudden now, they've got the responsibility of starting this movement that is going to go until Jesus returns and is going to reshape the planet and reshape humanity. It's going to recreate what God originally wanted, this this second exodus, the true exodus out of slavery and into righteousness, out of sin and into righteousness, out of slavery and into freedom. Then Jesus comes and he sends the Spirit and the Spirit empowers the people. And the question that we have to ask this morning is, are we connected to the Holy Spirit? Are you walking in the power of the Spirit? Am I walking in the power of the Holy Spirit? Do I recognize that through my faith in Christ, I have the Holy Spirit? And that the same Spirit who lit those guys on fire and they were able to go out and spread the gospel and 3,000 people came to faith in Christ, that same Holy Spirit is here today, indwelling His body, indwelling the church, indwelling you gifting you, empowering you, directing you, leading you. And Paul writes for us to keep in step with the Spirit. So here's the deal. Whether you recognize His presence or not doesn't change the fact that He's present with you. It's like we went into my, uh, my wife's great aunt's apartment in East Orange, New Jersey. To visit her and we stayed in this bedroom my wife and I did before we had kids and I remember for some reason I had to reach under the bed for the sheet or the cover or something. I felt something under there and I, I ended up getting down on my hands and knees and looking under and there were all these canned vegetables and toilet paper rolls of toilet paper she is squirreling all this stuff away and when she died like less than a year later they found Tens of thousands of dollars stuffed in her like, oh, what do, what do you call them that, pardon me, that old ladies wear and they've got these big pockets in the front, these house dresses or whatever. I don't know what they're called. But she had tens of thousands of dollars in the pockets. She had like over $100,000 in her closet and she was in a rent control apartment. She didn't need to squirrel toilet paper under the guest bedroom bed, but she did. She had all this resource. And you know what? When she would give us presents, she would come at Christmas and she would give us presents, they were wrapped in the comics page because she would keep the Sunday comics and that's what she would wrap the presents in because they're all cartoony and colorful and because she didn't want to spend money on wrapping paper. And that's probably how she got a quarter of a million dollars squirreled away here, there, and in accounts and everywhere. She had all this resource, but she didn't tap it. She left it. You can't leave the Holy Spirit to other people. You can't bequeath the Spirit onto your descendants, onto the people that you will your stuff to. 
they can get him on their own. <laughs> you can't, like, they've got to accept him on their own. And when we don't access the power of the Spirit in our life, it's not because he's not there. It's because for whatever reason, we've set other things in the world up as idols in front of us, and we're ignoring the resident presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And Jesus, right at the beginning in verse 15 and 16, he says, if you love me, faith and love intersect. He says, keep my commandments, obedience. And then what does he do right after that? He says, and I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate because you can't obey on your own. You can't do it on your own. So I'm, I'm going to send another advocate. I've been an advocate and am an advocate for you. I advocate for you. I argue the case. I help you. I assist you. I do for you what you can't do for yourself. But he will send another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the spirit of truth. So well, our responsibility and our response ability, we can respond. We have the ability to respond to the love of God with obedience. We can't do it in the flesh. We can't do it with our human strength. And God gives us the Holy Spirit. He comes right out of the gate there in John uh, 14, verse 16, 15 and 16, and he says it. I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. I don't expect you to obey in your own power. So on your notes page, I haven't gone to that yet, there's, there's just two blanks, and those two blanks are the Holy Spirit. Notice that when Jesus gives this command for us to obey, he immediately provides us help by promising us the Holy Spirit. And then love results in obedience. Jesus tells us four times that this love we have for him results in us keeping Jesus' commandments. Or more generally, he also uses the term word. And those four times are there. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. Now, these aren't quid pro quos. If you do this, I'll do that. That's not what these are. These are if you love me, the response, your natural relationship with, with me will be to obey me. But the key here is what are the commands? What are the commands? Because we could go back, we could go back to the book of Exodus. I have it marked here for such a time as this. I still can't get to it. Exodus chapter 20. And we see uh, these, uh, oh, the Ten Commandments. Did you know that we're in Exodus chapter 20? The second book, 20 in, is the Ten Commandments. Uh, don't have any other gods before me. Don't make for yourselves an image and bow down and worship it. Don't take my name in vain. Don't misuse the name of the Lord your God. Remember the Sabbath day, because six days God created. On the seventh, he rested. Honor your father and your mother. Don't murder. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't lie about your neighbor and give false testimony. And then don't covet anything that belongs to your neighbor. Well, those are the Ten Commandments. And they say that there are like some 600 more commands, some of them civil law commands, some of them moral commands, in the Old Testament, but then when Jesus was asked in the New Testament about which was the greatest command, he said, well, the greatest is to love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength, and the second is just like it. It's not like one and two, but it's like one and two. They're, they're the same. That's why later on Paul would only cite two and claim that all the law and the prophets hung on or the second one. And he didn't even cite the first one, but love the Lord your God and then love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said on these two commands, all 600 commands in the law and the prophets hang on those two commands. And then Jesus says in the previous chapter in John 13, a new command I give you, 
love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. And then I have a list of the commandments in your handout. These are the commands that Jesus gives in the Gospel of John. He says to receive me, to follow me. He says, says to the crippled man, which doesn't apply to us, but he says to him, get up, which is an easy command, except that he was crippled. So that was a very dark joke of Jesus, right? There's the crippled guy, you know, get up. But he healed him, so it was easy. But was it burdensome? Was that a burdensome command? It says somewhere in the New Testament that his commands are not burdensome. Well, it wasn't since he healed him. And receiving him is not burdensome. Following Jesus isn't burdensome. It's straightforward. Follow me. It's hard, but it's straightforward. Follow me. He tells Lazarus, rise from the dead. There was a command. That was an interesting one. <laughs> Believe in the light. Love each other, John 13. He says, believe in God. He says, believe in me. In, in John 15, we'll see, he says, abide in me, remain in me, rest in me. He says, ask whatever you want, whatever you wish, to glorify the Father. He says, abide in my love. And then in John 20, after he raises from the dead, he breathes on his disciples and he says, Receive the Holy Spirit. These are the commands that he gives in John. These are not difficult commands. These are not commands to dress a certain way or to follow a certain ritual or pattern. These aren't the kinds of commands that you see as the theocratic constitution of Israel lays out in the Old Testament, how a people of God are to live on the planet in light of the surrounding nations and how they comport themselves and, and live their lives and make a living and treat the earth and all that. These aren't those commands. These are love God and love one another. And he says, if you love me, if you believed in me and love me, that's the response that you're going to have. It's more of a response than an obligation. So responsibility is really a good word for it. It's the ability to respond that way when we have the Holy Spirit in our lives. And then the last thing on the notes page there, what did Jesus promise? Well, he made a few promises in this passage. He promised that the Father and the Spirit and that him would be with us forever. In fact, it says... Oh, I didn't mark it down. I found it quickly in the first service. Here we go. Verse 23. Jesus replied, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. He doesn't say should. And he says my teaching. He points to his unique teaching. His teaching. The teaching that Jesus had been given over and over and over and over teaching about loving one another. And then he says, my Father will love them and we will come, come to them. The Father and I will come to them and make our home with them. Look at verse 20. On that day you will realize that I am in the Father and you are are in me, and I am in you. Remember last week we talked about, you know, in the Father's hand and Jesus' hand, no one take about all that stuff. Now you got this crazy verse. Try to, try to draw that out. Try to CAD draw that in three-dimensional on your computer. That, that Jesus is in the Father, but we're in Jesus, but that he's in us. What is he trying to say? He's trying to say we're in this together. How do you even put it into words? There's an intimacy. There's a union. There's a oneness. And again, it's that picture, it's that picture of the Trinity inviting us into the middle of them, of him, of this God 
invites us into the middle that we're, we're enveloped by him, we're indwelt by him, and yet we're also in him. The people that looked at some of these space pictures said that what they saw was unfathomable. Yeah, this too. This is unfathomable because you're going you're gonna to walk out the door and you're going to get in your vehicle and you're going to be in your vehicle. <laughs> your vehicle is going to have you in the vehicle. Oh, that's intimate. That's close, right? You're in the vehicle. Then you're going to drive home and then you're going to get out of the vehicle. Jesus says, I am in the Father and you are in me and I am in you. That's a state of being. That's not, it doesn't like move around. It's, it's a state of being. We're fused with God. We're one with God. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 6, it says that our spirit and God's spirit is one spirit. Just like a husband and wife, when they come together, they're one flesh. In that same comparison, God uses that comparison to say that we are one with him in spirit. We are one spirit. You think you're alone? You think you're on your own? Jesus said, I'm not going to leave you as orphans. You're not going to be in the condition of an orphan who is without mother or father without any oversight, without any provision, without any protection. Jesus said, I'm not going to leave you like that. You won't be orphaned. In fact, he says, the term is, I will presence myself with you. I'll be, my presence will be, he said, I'll be there. You ever at some place and you're looking around for somebody? Oh, they're not here. That'll never be Jesus. He's always going to be present. So show the third picture that we've got for this morning in, in Psalm 17 or I'm sorry 19 it says the heavens declare the web telescope shows the heavens that declare the glory of God the skies proclaim the work of his hands the next one day after day they pour forth speech and night after night, they reveal knowledge. So tonight when it gets dark, go outside. And if it's clear, you'll see the stars. The God who is infinite, we have no words. Also can way down and indwell you. I had a guy who works with electron microscopes in the first service. He said that when you take a grain of sand, which he did off the beach, and he puts it under the electron microscope, and you get down, and you look at that grain of sand, there are all these hundreds of thousands of little tiny grains of sand with patterns that, are, that show design. Like, I just see dirt and I just want to get it off the bottom of my shoe. <laughs> and he was like, no, when you look deep down, you see the, the beauty and the design in these little tiny flecks of the grain of sand. So the God who is totally immense is also creating design in that little tiny little thing. That God lives in us, and he wants to have a relationship with us and fellowship with us. That, that's just beautiful. So when you go, you don't go by yourself. and You can't get away from him. You can't get away. Don't think just because you go in the other room or you turn the lights off or you close your Bible or you look down and not put your face toward God like he's not there. He's there. He's there. So when you're tempted, look up. Because we don't want him to say about us, they turn their backs to me and not their faces, right? When you're tempted, look up. God, my face is to you. Okay, and now I'm going to behave. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you that you love us. Thank you that you showed us, even through this little keyhole picture in your word, these few verses this morning, yet you inhabit, Lord, 
Your, your power and your presence inhabits the smallest of particles. In your design and your, the fingerprint of your essence and your character are placed there. And God, you put your fingerprint on us. You created us, and in your image you created us. To bring glory to you, you created us. So Lord, I pray if there's one here this morning who's never placed their faith in the crucified and risen King, the King Jesus, who was crucified for our sins and rose again and lives so that we can live. God, I pray that if there's one here who's never placed their faith in Jesus, that they would do that this morning. To say, Lord Jesus, forgive me, a sinner. I place my faith in you this morning. And as much as I know how, as best I can, I trust in you to be my God. Help me to respond to you in obedience and in love. Lord, we worship you, we thank you, and we praise you this morning in Jesus' name. Amen.